The battery is probably the most important and not to mention expensive part of your Tesla. So properly taking care of it should be at the top of your priority list. I recently made a video where I did a battery degradation test on my almost two year old Model 3. And I discovered that all of the little things that I had been doing to maintain battery health had been paying off. As my battery had lost only about half of what most nickel based batteries are predicted to lose in the first one to two years. So if you're planning to keep your Tesla for a very long time, or maybe even help maintain some of that resale value, then you're in the right place as I'll be covering everything I do and how to charge your Tesla the right way. So the first thing you should do if you're looking at maintaining good long-term battery health is ABC. And no, I don't mean always be closing, always be charging. And you can actually modify that to ABPI or always be plugged in. A plugged in Tesla is a happy Tesla. Tesla actually tells you directly from the manual that the most important way to preserve the high voltage battery is to leave your vehicle plugged in when you're not using it. They also go on to state that there is no advantage to waiting until the battery level is low before charging and the battery performs best when charged regularly. I see quite a few people that are able to get away with charging up to 80 to 90% once a week and then just staying unplugged the rest of the time. And while short term, it's not that big of a deal, long term, well, it's not recommended. Also not to mention when the car is plugged in, it's able to run system tests via line power, bypassing the battery and reducing cycles while also helping with BMS calibration so the percent you see is actually what you have. So for anyone out there wondering if you should unplug once you've reached your charge limit, no, just stay plugged in. Anytime my car is not being driven and I can plug in, I'm plugged in. If the car is below its charge limit, it'll charge. If not, it's still plugged in. Speaking of charge limit, that's actually our next tip optimized states of charge. Now everyone's optimal state of charge is gonna be different, but this is how you can find yours. Start by setting your daily limit to 80% and charge it up every night to that. After a week, see what your average end of day state of charge is. Then adjust your daily charge limit down until your average end of day state of charge is around 20 to 30%. Your goal here is to have your car around that 50% mark as much as possible. The chart on screen now shows nickel based battery stress at different SO Sees. And as you can see, that 20 to 50 range is really where you want to be. However, if you have an LFP battery, then take everything I just said and throw it out the window. Set your car to 100% and charge it to that as much as possible. Tesla recommends at least once a week, but in reality, if you can do it every night, the better. If you're unsure whether you have an LFP battery pack or not, just go into your car's charging settings and adjust the charging limit slider above 80%. If the car warns you that you should stay at 80% for daily usage, then you don't have an LFP pack. If the car doesn't warn you, then you do have an LFP battery pack. I personally have my daily state of charge at 50%. It's plenty for me and has been great for my battery. Now, real quick, I do want to give a quick shout to Test Stuff and our new RGB dash light strip. Super easy to install, looks OEM, thousands of color combinations via an app. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that if you're looking for like an ambient RGB light for your interior, this is the one to get. They are on back order, but not like a crazy back order. We're expecting them to ship in like two to three weeks so by the end of this month. I'll have it linked down below and don't forget that you can use code YouTube, all caps, for 10% off. And while we're on the topic of state of charge, let's talk about extreme states of charge. A lot of people have this misconception that you shouldn't, assuming you don't have an LFP battery, take the battery to 100% or let it get down to sub 10 or even 5%. And it's just that, a misconception. If it was all so damaging and terrible for your battery pack, then why would Tesla let you do it? In reality, it's completely fine to charge up to 100% and use your whole battery going all the way down to as low as 5%. The problem comes in when you're at those extreme SOCs and you allow the car to just sit there. That's when battery stress is at its highest. I've charged my car to 100% plenty of times, along with taking it to sub 10 or even 5%, but I never let it sit at those levels. If I need to charge to 100% at home, like I'm preparing for a road trip, I'm leaving within 10 to 15 minutes of it hitting 100%. If I'm at a supercharger and it hits 100%, well, then of course I'm leaving pretty much immediately. So don't be afraid to take the car up to 100% and as low 
low as 5%. Also, another little tip here, 0% in newer Teslas is not actually 0%. Most newer Teslas have around a three-ish kilowatt hour buffer at the bottom of the battery, assuming your BMS isn't all out of whack. So we've been talking a lot about states of charge and home charging, but what type of home charger should you get to maintain good battery health? You may have heard that the slower the charger, the better for battery degradation. And while that is technically true, there are some trade-offs and they're big enough trade-offs that I wouldn't recommend the slowest charger. There are two levels of home charging. Level one, otherwise known as charging off of a normal plug or 120 volt outlet. And level two, otherwise known as a utility plug for your stove slash dryer, a special charging station, or a 240 volt outlet. There aren't many variations of level one charging and all of them will get you anywhere between three to six miles per hour. Level two, on the other hand, can vary anywhere from high teens to mid forties in terms of miles per hour charged. Level Level one also has the worst efficiency in terms of power used from the wall versus what actually gets put in the car and can even struggle in extreme cold. I've experienced instances where a level one charger was barely replenishing the energy that the car was using to just keep the battery up to temp so it could actually charge. So while yes, a slower charger is technically better, you're giving up upwards of 10x the charging speed, better efficiency, and no problems charging in the extreme cold. Plus the battery health benefit, in my opinion, is so minimal that it's not even worth considering using a level one charger just for battery health. Now, quickly pivoting off saving your battery health to saving your wallet. I said there weren't many variations of level one charging, but there are a lot for level two. You can get a 240 volt outlet of your choosing installed and use the mobile connector along with your corresponding plug, a random third party J1772 charging box, or a Tesla wall connector. And I really can't recommend a J1772 charging station simply due to the fact that it's old tech, or at least here in North America, as the Tesla connector is becoming the standard now. If you're looking to get the most bang for your buck, assuming no tax incentives, a 240 volt plug plus the mobile connector is going to be the way to go. If your Tesla did not come with a mobile connector, you can pick one up from Tesla that comes with a NEMA 1450 adapter for around $200. From there, just get a NEMA 1450 plug installed and you're good to go. Plus the mobile connector would have also come with a normal plug that you can take the whole thing with you for road trips and such as a backup. A NEMA 1450 on the Gen 2 mobile connector achieves 32 amps or about 30 miles per hour. Plenty of speed to get you from zero to 80% while you sleep. However, there are a few reasons to go with the Tesla wall connector. First, if your electric company has some sort of incentive on charging stations, you'd be surprised on how many people I hear that went with the wall connector because it was free because they got a rebate with their electric company. Secondly, if you want the fastest speeds possible as the wall connector can go up to 44 miles per hour. Third, you wanna get multiple chargers for multiple Teslas. The Tesla wall connectors can be daisy chained off of each other on the same breaker. And then fourth, it looks a lot better and the cable is actually longer. So while yes, it is double the price at over $400 plus install versus the mobile connector and you can't take it with you, it may be worth considering if any of those pros interest you. There's also a new wall connector called like the universal connector now that actually has a J1772 adapter built in and it can do power sharing to your home, assuming that you have a cyber truck or they introduce that to like future Tesla models that may be worth considering if you have a cyber truck or you potentially want the future ability to power share to your home. I charged off of a level one charger for the first year and then finally upgraded to a level two NEMA 1450 and it's been a game changer. And as I am looking at getting rid of the gas car in my household in favor of getting another Tesla, I do plan to eventually upgrade to a wall connector for the even faster speeds and the ability to install multiple on the same breaker. Now the next tip to maintaining good battery health is to avoid DC fast charging as your primary form of charging. You go from upwards of 44 miles per hour to over a thousand. Also not to mention, it's dumping all of that juice directly into your battery pack as it's now a direct current. Now, if you're only planning to keep the car short term, you're on a lease or something, the extra battery degradation won't really be that substantial or that bad. It's long-term owners that should really take caution. There are studies that show worse battery degradation over time when exposed to increased voltage and temp. And guess what? DC fast charging is just that, more voltage and higher temps. 
this. Plus, if supercharging is your primary form of charging, then that likely means you don't have a home charger, meaning you can't keep your car plugged in and you have to overcharge it to make it multiple days, meaning your car is spending less time between that 40 to 60 mark. And on top of all that, supercharging is almost the same price as gas. And if you're relying on it as your primary form of charging, then you're missing out on the best part of owning a Tesla, having a gas station at your house and waking up with a full tank every day. You just don't have to think about it when you have home charging. I rarely ever supercharge only when I'm on road trips. And to be honest with you, if I couldn't charge at home, I wouldn't own a Tesla or any EV for that matter. And people get upset with me for recommending people not buy Teslas or EVs if they can't charge at home, but that's just truly what I believe. Like it's in my best interest as a Tesla YouTuber to get you to buy a Tesla. So if I'm recommending that you don't, it's because I truly believe that you're just gonna have a subpar experience and I just don't want you to have that. And then the final way to maintain battery health is more so how to make doing what we've just talked about a lot easier using the in-car systems and scheduled charging using the built-in systems right on your tesla can have the car start charging when you want stop charging when you want only charge to a certain percentage or even limit charging power just head on into your charging settings to configure all of that that way you can set it once and forget about it and if the in-car options aren't as customizable as you might need them to be well then you have apps like teslify for example during the winter i have two four hour on peak periods per day and the in-car system just can't comprehend that. But with Teslify, it's no problem. I tell it when to start and stop and even the location. So if I'm traveling and I'm connected to something like a destination charger, it doesn't accidentally stop charging me at like 6 a.m. because I forgot to disable the scheduled charging, which actually happened to me once when I was relying on the in-car scheduled charging. It can assist in making sure that your car is charging to aid in battery health, while at the same time, making sure you're not charging during on-peak hours, which aids your wallet. I am very much a drive hard and plug in type of owner and everything that I've covered in this video, I don't see as being over the top. Like I've seen some people tell you to not accelerate hard when your battery is cold or to just not supercharge when it's super hot outside. But if I start recommending that level of craziness, then I feel like it just becomes an inconvenience. If you haven't seen my video where I do a full battery degradation test, I highly recommend it as I show you how you can do the test yourself to figure out your own battery health. And if you do, then make sure you let me know what your battery health is is, along with your charging habits down in the comment section. If you're new around here and you wanna see more Tesla related stuff in your YouTube feed, then feel free to subscribe. I'd appreciate it. And I will see you all in the next one. Peace.